about a year and a half ago, I asked Ken Keller if he would be our 34th and 35th Piercy professor. Um, so, and the mission is to write a department history, and that's what Ken is in the middle of doing, and you're going to hear something uh, about what he, what he has to say on this topic uh, today. Ken is the one person, uh, maybe besides Ed Cussler, who needs no introduction here. Um, Ken was hired by Amundsen in 1964. Um, after finishing a PhD in chemical engineering at Johns Hopkins University and a stint in the Navy as a nuclear engineer. Um, Ken was one of the early founders of biomedical engineering. He was interested in transport issues in biology, uh, in, in human health, so oxygen transport in the blood, for example. Uh, he started the biomedical engineering program here, the program, not the, not the department, in the uh, 1970s. Uh, he was head of this department from 1978 to 1980. He was provost and vice president for academic affairs and then president of the university from 85 to 88. After his stint as president, Ken entered the field of public policy, um, as, particularly as it relates to science and technology, and he's had a number of appointments uh, in that area, uh, particularly at the Humphrey Institute here at the University of Minnesota, but also the Woodrow Wilson School for Public Affairs at Princeton, and he is currently adjunct professor at the School of Advanced International Studies for Johns Hopkins University, which conveniently happens to be in Bologna. So he spends half his time uh, in Italy, and so we're pleased that he spent the fall semester with us here. So please, Ken, thank you for being our 34th and 35th Piercy Professor. The Bologna connection is, is an interesting one and shows the limitations of technology. When we first went there, my daughter was just starting high school, and so I needed to find a high school and Google high school Bologna. We got about 10,000 hits. It was the lunch menus at American High School. <laughs> <laughs> so, there, are, there are issues uh, of this sort. Uh, this writing, a his, I'm not a historian, but it turns out that since it's merely a hundred year history, it's more biography than it is, uh, than it is history for me. Uh, I'm one of three or four of us around here who have been here more than half of that hundred years, uh, which is saying a lot, but the vital signs are good and I'm not drooling, I take solid food. <laughs> and all of that's true. But in thinking about how to approach this, there are several ways you can approach a history of this sort. One is obviously that you can just go on a sentimental journey and all the things you remembered, and that, that's fun to do and probably will we'll do it in part. The other is you spew out the facts. On day one we did this, on the 10th year we did that, and then we opened this office on the, uh, on the 20th year. Uh, that's boring. Uh, what, what does strike me as an interesting thing to do is to see whether or not that history has lessons, uh, and whether or not in viewing that history you learn something about higher education, you learn something about the development of a profession, and that is pretty much what uh, I'm trying to do and what I will try to focus on today to give you some sense of connection. Uh, I start out with a connection, uh, a dedication. I, I, don't, I won't oversell this, but you see these four faces in the main office almost every day that you're here. Uh, and. Uh, probably know not as much about them as I wish you did, or you wish you did, but this, the, these four represent in many ways the strength of uh, the chemical engineering material science department here. The strength and the interest and the diversity. Uh, two of them are mathematicians, not chemical engineers. One of them is a physical chemist, not a chemical engineer. And the chemical engineer there is a very unusual fellow in almost every respect, actually, he came here originally when, at a time when his most important publication was on the, uh, on the behavior of strong droplets of wine, uh, uh, droplets of wine and strong, and strong alcohol. Uh, Marangoni effect, uh, Kostler. <laughs> uh, so each of them has headed the department, except for Scriven. Scriven did not head the department, but Scriven was the, uh, a motivating force in many of the developments within the department and its teaching. When we uh, came together with material science, uh, 
It was Skip who was out front in, uh, in figuring the things we could do and being creative about how we do that. All four of them were regents professors at the university, which is a very distinguished position to hold. Of course, all four of them are in the National Academy of Engineering, and I forget which ones are also in the National Academy of Sciences, but it's, it, it's a group of four people who are extraordinary not only in their own right, but represent in an extraordinary way the fact that there are others like them in the department. These are not simply the four people we talk about. They're four of, uh, of, of, in a group which goes on and on. So I, I just wanted to say something about them at this point. We'll come back to them in, in, as we talk about the, the department itself. The connection that, or the context in which I think it's, it's valuable to speak, to speak about this department is to recognize that it's embedded uh, in a, a research university, and particularly a public land grant university. And that suggests several kinds of constraints and several kinds of opportunities which determine how the departments within that institution should behave or should be thinking about the world. So let me talk about what each of those words mean. The first is that it is public. And the quotation that I often use when talking about public higher education is a Thomas Jefferson uh, argument when he was responsible for founding the University of Virginia, that it was to avail the state of those talents which nature has shown equally among the poor as the rich and which perish without use if not sought for and cultivated. It's the strongest statement I can think of concerning what our obligation is to teaching, what our obligation is to education, what our obligation is to people regardless of their status. It's also an argument one can make today when people begin uh, are talking about higher education as a private good rather than a public good. Thomas Jefferson understood that differently. Uh, it's very much a public good in an important way. The land grant idea is actually uh, involves grants of land. The Morrill Land Grant Act was uh, passed in 1862 in the midst of the Civil War signed by Abraham Lincoln, but motivated by the work of a, of, of a senator from Vermont named Justin Morrill, who argued that the federal government should make grants of land to each of the states in order to form at least one college in each state where the leading object shall be without excluding other scientific or classical studies to teach such branches of learning as are related to agriculture and the mechanic arts in order to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes in the several pursuits and professions in life. I used to be able to say that without reading it. Uh, I, I, I seem to have lost that a bit. But I want to, uh, to mention a couple of things here. One is, notice the, the bolded part, without excluding other scientific or classical studies. The Moral Land Grant Act uh, didn't come easily. It actually was rejected at one point and, and uh, came into being again because there was a big fight about whether or not the institutions of the state should be very practical. We ought to have farm schools. We ought to have uh, schools that train people vocationally. And it wasn't important to have classical studies that could be done at private institutions. It wasn't important to have fundamental knowledge because fundamental knowledge was a waste. Uh, there were those who recognized that, in fact, you couldn't have a very practical education at the level we were talking about unless you had fundamental studies going on in a, in a more comprehensive way. So that was one fight that went on and that was resolved by putting this statement into the act, arguing that the practical requirements of the Moral Land Grant Act did not suggest or require that we not be involved in fundamental studies. The other thing that's, I think, very important in thinking about this department and thinking about uh, the Moral Land Grant Act and the land grant institutions is it, was, it made awards of land to the states. There were no national universities in the United States, and since then have not become any national universities. So that, in fact, the national purposes in education are met by a federation of private and public institutions which are more alike than not alike in what they have to provide. And that, that we expect, therefore, that a department like chemical engineering certainly serves the state of Minnesota, but it has an obligation more at, at the national level, it has an obligation at the international level, and th that sometimes is in tension with what we 
what, what we would argue within the state we ought to be doing, but it's a tension that has to be resolved in favor of the national purpose that these institutions uh, play. So that's the second thing that I think is important. The third I'd call your attention to is we nominally talk about teaching and research, and we add service to that as well. But oftentimes we use that phrase in the breach without thinking much about uh, what we really mean by teaching and research and how do we exploit those synergies. When this act came out, when, when, when the land-grant institutions came about and we started talking about teaching and research, there were two extremes at, at work in, this, in, the, in the country. The, there were the old-fashioned East Coast Ivy League schools that uh, uh, didn't think that, that, that thought their role was to transmit the canon, not to think about things. And this quote, uh, uh, Taylor at Yale commenting on Josiah Willard Gibbs, I would rather have 10 settled opinions and nine of them wrong than be like my brother Gibbs with none of the 10 settled. By the way, this is not Gibbs as you know. This is Gibbs as you know's father, who was a professor of theology uh, when, and got a job for his son without pay at Yale a couple of miles away from the campus because they didn't want any contamination from thermodynamics. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this was one side of it. The other was uh, the proud position of Johns Hopkins University, which emulated the German model of the Herr Professor surrounded by a few students. Uh, uh, and it, it was, presents itself as the quintessential university that started out with graduate schools. And uh, Roland, who was a professor of physics, when asked what he do with undergraduates in his laboratory, do with them, do with them, I shall ignore them. Uh, we had the other extreme that one talks about a research enterprise that doesn't involve any kind of teaching. Those are the two extremes. The question is, how do we find our way in the middle? And this department has thought a lot about where to find its way in that middle. And the fourth uh, is <clears throat> a, a quote that I think is particularly apt in this setting. And that is a, a, a Halford Mackinder, who was a geographer at Oxford, a very distinguished one around the turn of the 19th to 20th century, made the statement that all knowledge is one. Its division into subjects is a concession to human weakness. What's that about? Uh, it's actually a two-edged statement. It recognizes that, in fact, uh, in order for human beings to be able to develop and absorb knowledge, you have to break it down a little bit. You can't get it all. But if you forget about putting it back together, you really haven't, in fact, created the system that you need. So on the one side, it says, think hard about what it means to, to create a discipline and when you need a discipline. On the other side, it says, don't let those disciplinary boundaries stop you along the way. And it's, it's that the two sides of these things which uh, are very important. And uh, that's true not only in the combination of, uh, of being concerned with the arts and the humanities, with social sciences, as well as the technical field, which has been true here, but also to be concerned with when the scientific knowledge is such that you want to create a new field. After all, chemical engineering only began in the end of the 19th century. Uh, did we need to have chemical engineering? If we did, what do we add to it along the way? That, that, what do we put within that discipline? When do we have to create a new discipline? Well, when is, are you better off not doing that? We want to answer that a little bit uh, or think about that when we talk about the history of the department. So let's look at some dates uh, just to get a sense of where this is the fact stuff that goes into a history. Uh, actually, the University of Minnesota was formed before the state of Minnesota was formed. The territorial uh, legislature established it in 1851. Uh, of course, it gave them no money, and it gave them no classrooms, and it gave them no buildings. So not a lot happened. They did put up a building, uh, which became the state insane asylum. <laughs> but only for a while. Uh, they got rid of those people, and they, they didn't have to get rid of the squatters that came in and, and the farm animals that they brought with them. But uh, that, that was a burden, uh, to be sure. In any event, it was 1858, several years later, that the Minnesota became a state. Uh, when it became a state, uh, it incorporated into the state constitution the University of Minnesota. So one of the things you'll often hear about 
is people saying the University of Minnesota is not subject to the legislature, except for a small thing, money. <laughs> <laughs> But, but it can't make laws about the state. In fact, at one time, the legislature was actually very annoyed about this and managed to get uh, a, a referendum into, uh, into, the, into one of our elections, uh, which was literally said, shall the University of Minnesota be subject to law? <laughs> it failed. <laughs> but it failed because of a lack of a quorum. <laughs> Uh, in any event, it hasn't done us a great deal of good, although we frequently make claims of that. Uh, the first classes did finally meet in 1869, and it is interesting that the, the science that was established was chemistry. The, chemi the professor of chemistry also had to teach French and Latin, but that, uh, as any of them could uh, uh, in those days, not, uh, or any, maybe perhaps today. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Uh, in any event, uh, the chemistry was, was, the, was there at the beginning, at the very beginning. There was a school of minds created, and I put that in because that, of course, is the grandparent or the, the earlier uh, school which gave rise in part to the, the grouping of chemical engineering and material science later. It came about not because the university wanted it, but because there was a mining industry in the state that pushed the university to create that without thinking about what would be taught or whether they had anybody to teach it. And it was an indication of where some of the tension in a public university within a state comes into being. Uh, the first four, chemistry was a service function until in the 1890s when it finally had its own majors. And the first four graduates who were graduates of chemistry had on their certificates that they were in chemical engineering, which didn't exist. And nobody could really explain what it was, but that was because we didn't yet have an AICHE, and, I, and I, in a minute I'll talk about the beginnings of, uh, of, the, of the chemical engineering profession, but it really wasn't determined what that was, so it was anybody's guess. In 1902, George Frankfurter, who was sometimes viewed uh, as the founder of the School of Chemistry, wrote to then President Cyrus Northrup suggesting that we really needed a chemical engineering program, uh, which was extraordinary. Of course, there were no committees to meet. There were no uh, people who were in charge of anything. Uh, Cyrus Northrop, however, took 17 years to respond <laughs> and finally said yes in 1919. But uh, that was, of course, when the, the department were, was, officially, uh, was officially put in place. And that is why 2019 is the 100th year of the department. Uh, the problem that came in this ambiguity of, gen of chemical engineering was we were just starting down the road of defining a field, a discipline called chemical engineering. And it started out, many of you may know, with George Davis in 1887 who coined the term chemical engineering. Uh, and uh, his, he was an inspector of, of industrial machinery in England who uh, essentially was hired by the government to go around and check on machinery, and he began to see machinery as, uh, in the industrial age as, as uh, being part of a new kind of profession. And so he developed a set of lectures which he gave at the University of Manchester on chemical engineering, and that was the first use of it. It was immediately copied the next year by a chemist at uh, MIT, Lewis Norton, and the first, pro the, the chemical engineering program at MIT began then in 18, uh, 1888, uh, but it, it still had not settled the issue of where and the chemical engineering profession ought to be. And the two people who were the principals in the argument were William Walker, uh, in the chem who, who ultimately became chemical engineering at, at MIT, and Arthur Noyes, who lost the argument and went to Caltech. And the difference between the two was the strong emphasis that William Walker placed on practical knowledge and working out with industry, and the strong emphasis that Noyes wanted to place on industrial chemistry, uh, but in the laboratory rather than working outside. And the two never came together. Uh, Caltech started down Noyes's path. I would say that the two of them have come more together over time. But we had this ambiguity about what chemical engineering was, Everybody knew it was some combination of industrial chemistry and mechanical engineering, 
but where that, that nexus ought to be was never fully developed or never unambiguously developed, uh, which raised the question of what is chemical engineering. And at the time, the closest thing to a definition was something put forward by a professor at Columbia University, Whitaker, who said that the chemical engineer works in the organization, operation, and management of existing or proposed processes with a view to building a successful manufacturing industry. His fundamental training in chemistry, engineering, physics, mathematics must be combined with knowledge of engineering methods and appliances. The interesting thing about the definition is we're starting out defining the profession in terms of, this, of, the, org of the industry it serves rather than particularly any particular set of, uh, of uh, disciplines or any particular uh, knowledge base that you would have. It covers everything, but what does it cover? Those things involved in the industry. And the question that has come up over the years, and I anticipate the answer because uh, we change that here at, at Minnesota and at a couple of other schools, is, is, is this a reason for being? that you have an industry and let's call the engineers those who serve the industry. Is it a useful paradigm in telling you what sorts of things people ought to know? Is it an anchor stopping you from expanding? Or is it a sail that helps you to go forward in applications in other areas? That's what the question was. So let's take the chem engineering timeline uh, in, uh, in Minnesota, uh, which really has, uh, from the 1919 beginning, uh, the chemical engineering division was established. Uh, I, I will come back to it. It's the Doc Mann's era, 3M. 3M stands for Mann, Montana, and Montillion, who were the first three uh, professors in the department. <laughs> so it's always called the 3Ms. There's another use of the 3M, but I won't go in. <laughs> uh, uh, until 1949, we, we finally got a building, and we entered the Amundsen era, which went till 19... Uh, uh, 74, and then uh, the era uh, which I would call the era following the marriage of chemical engineering and metallurgy in 1970. So this is the, the life of the department. And what we're going to do is look into that life. Interestingly, the leadership uh, isn't, has a very few people in it. In fact, if I do something, I add uh, man at the beginning and uh, frisbee. <laughs> At the end, you have, uh, what, three, six, eight people who were, cover the entire hundred years of the department in terms of the leadership. It's really rather an amazing uh, fact. Now, if it's skewed by the fact that Mann was there for 30 years, that's an outlier, and Keller was there for two years. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the other side. But it still turns out to be pretty high. <laughs> Uh, in, in, in that. So well, let's go back and let's talk about the beginning, the man era, uh, the Doc Man era. Do, uh, that we, that's when we got a place to call our own. Uh, this is it. It looks a little like Smith Hall. Well, I don't want you to think we had it all. We actually had the basement uh, <laughs> over on the right <laughs> for 30 years. Uh, we had that basement. Uh, and uh, one of the problems, one of the consequences of that is when we were, when the architect said to the department, we're going to give you a building on Washington Avenue, what would you like in it? They said, all we want is windows. <laughs> <laughs> now, there, 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 was so much in, in, there was so much oriented toward windows. Look closely, don't look at the cars. Look at the open windows. They didn't put air conditioning in. <laughs> and so for two, for two Decades we lived in the sweltering heat of summer until we finally got enough money to air condition, air condition the building. But that's an aside. People aren't always bright. This was Charles Mann. Charles Mann, who was the division chief uh, for 30 years, uh, from 1919 to 1949. Uh, he was sort of a chemical engineer, but he'd been trained at Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> actually, he'd been trained in, in uh, food chemistry. Uh, he worked on palmetto nuts or something uh, like that. But he, uh, his, real, his real purpose in life uh, was uh, that he was the band leader uh, of the Wisconsin band for seven years. Uh, 
uh, from an, as an undergraduate, and we needed a cheerleader. So he came to Minnesota and made it seem as if the basement of Miss Smith Hall was really a great place to be. Uh, and he uh, led, uh, uh, he led uh, the system where the laboratory looked like this. I think that must be a filter press. Uh, but it reminds me of my undergraduate unit ops lab, and of course the, the only reason for showing where we, I, we had crushing and grinding. I don't think any of you have ever had a course in crushing and grinding. Uh, but we, again, the orientation at, at that time was not even unit ops per se. It was equipment, and, and if you read the descriptions of what Mann was very proud of, it was that he had a well-equipped undergraduate laboratory in, in, in there, and that was essentially what happened for 30 years. The interesting thing was the department did well, but it didn't do very important things. It, was, it, was, it followed what was getting done elsewhere, uh, and, uh, and it, it, it existed because more of the majors in chemistry wanted to be chemical engineers than wanted simply to be chemists, and it, it was a perfectly healthy way to go, so they'd had no trouble with enrollments but they weren't doing anything in which you would say they're taking the lead in either the university or in the country in what was going on. Uh, and so we had a second, uh, uh, a second era, the Amundsen era, and that's where everything changed. Everything changed when we finally got this fellow, Neil R. Amundsen, who was head for 25 years, and you can see it covered, uh, it covered various stages of his life. I said to Dan, You'll notice he wears a tie there, but as he gets older, he doesn't wear a tie. I'm trying to stay young. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm, not, I'm not doing that. Neil Amundsen was the, the, the poster child for a public university and its students. He was born and raised a few miles east of here uh, in, in, a, in a poor area of St. Paul. And he traveled uh, to the university uh, to, uh, and, or, and, and enrolled in chemistry, which he stayed with until he got to organic lab, and then he became a chemical engineer. Uh, uh, but he, he worked very hard, he did very well uh, all through school. He was intensely organized around the fact that you needed to get a practical profession in life, and he was disappointed with chemical engineering. He said, nobody wants to know what's, why things are happening. They show me correlations. They say, this is where you work the equipment, you turn this valve and you turn that. But nobody wanted to, to talk about the fundamentals in any way, and it was very unsatisfying to him. He got his degree in chemical engineering, and he then went to, uh, uh, Standard, to Exxon, actually, at the time, down in Baton Rouge, where he stayed a couple of years and really couldn't take it. But what happened during the, at that time was that he registered at Louisiana State University in mathematics, which the undergraduate program in chemical engineering didn't really have at the time. And he got totally enamored with it, wanted to go back to school, came back to Minnesota to do his graduate work, uh, and uh, got, started in chemical engineering, found that he really didn't like it at all, and switched to the mathematics department. And so he was in mathematics, earning his PhD, but he was asked, this was in the post-Second World War era, I'm sorry, this was in the post-Depression era, and, and, and things were getting, uh, were getting over to the point where people were back in school, and he had, was asked to offer a course in mathematics in the chemical engineering department, which he did. It was the most popular course uh, that the students had ever taken, and they went in a group to see Doc Mann, and said, you got to get this guy to come into our department. Uh, this, he, uh, he's just too good, and he's the best course we've ever had. And Mann uh, decided to do that, and uh, finally made an offer, it took some time. Uh, they met up in the cam campus club with great frequency when Tim Mann would say, why don't you come and work for us? And he would say, are you going to talk, or are you going to you can offer something? <laughs> and he offered something. And then man died suddenly in 1949. And they did a national search. The national search uh, was a failure. Actually, they thought it wasn't a failure. We have a budget for the year 19, uh, let's see, 1950, which lists 
a head of the department with this salary who never came. <laughs> and uh, that was pointed out by Neil, to, he was, who was acting head from 1949 on. That was pointed out to the then Dean Athelson Spillhouse, a name you probably don't know and we don't have time to go into. That's another whole story. Uh, he was a very interesting guy. Uh, and Neil said, there is no head. And Athelson said, well, we hired a head. And there's supposed to be one there. Where <laughs> And they called him and he said he changed his mind. And Neil said, you need a head. And he said, if you pick X, who was the only other full professor in the department, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> so they picked Neil. And so Neil took over in 1951. He'd been acting head since 49. And that was when he started to think about what he wanted. And he took about a half dozen years to say, I, I really want a department that's looking into fundamental ideas. I want a department that's making use of mathematics. I want a department that has people who are, uh, who are highly qualified, of very good quality, and very committed. And he had some help along the way. A along the way to his PhD, he had gone to Brown. Uh, he was, remember, a PhD student in mathematics. And he had been thrown into the applied mathematics group at, at Brown which was superb, which was uh, known throughout the world uh, for, for its quality. And he realized what it was like to be in, a, in, a, in an environment in which th there, was, there was churning of, of ideas and of, of interest. And then he, <clears throat> in the subsequent years to his becoming head, he wound up at Cambridge for a year. And again, he wound up with a group of people who were enormously productive and more than that, interested and engaged. And he came back, he said, that's what I want, is I want the innovations that come with that. By that time, he'd been head for four or five years, and it was about 1955. And Ken Denby came over and spent a year uh, on sabbatical here in this department. You, you, many of you would be familiar with Denby's thermodynamics uh, work. Uh, and that, too, engaged uh, Neil. And so uh, he started to think about how you, what, you, what it took to build an innovative culture. Uh, and, he, and, and this is the kind of idea, these are the kinds of ideas that came up in, in, his, uh, in his, his thought. You have to get the right people. That's kind of a question begging uh, statement, but an important one. You have to overcome the tyranny of disciplines you, because you want to mul motivate multidisciplinary approaches and the value uh, uh, th this term, the value of product and process goals, mean the way to approach uh, the total development of a product or a process is essentially a multi-dimensional, a multi, uh, uh, a multidisciplinary uh, aspect. You need to bring things from other areas, so it helps you to folk. It helps you to draw together people when you have a goal uh, together. You have to uh, learn how to communicate across these disciplinary boundaries. And you have to avoid hierarchies. You have to seek generalizations. His great argument uh, about the undergraduate courses in things like transport processes was that nobody was trying to generalize. They were getting empirical correlations and using them. But nobody wanted to dig down and say, what's underlying all of this? Uh, he didn't use the term uh, talk about Kessler, but I do. Arthur Kessler argued that the creative act was an act not so much of coming up de novo with an idea, but t taking two disparate ideas and putting them together. And the, and the, great, the great advantage is in that combination. And he called that by association. And so uh, what Amundsen didn't say but understood was that we had to move from association to by association. And that success in innovation in any case took luck. That is to say, it's very hard to consciously build quality. You take advantage of opportunities when they come along. And you have to have the right tools to bring them together and to make the other things work. So he had a whole set of ideas about what could, uh, what could uh, make this department what he wanted it to be. And so there was there the Amundsen hiring strategies. First, you fit the position to the person, not the reverse. You find smart people like Eris sitting at a desk in Imperial Chemicals, and you say, why don't you come? We'll find out some way of hiring you and helping you and, uh, and talking the dean into it. Hire first, clear it with the dean afterward. <laughs> it's better to apologize than to ask. Uh, 
Hi only hire people smarter than you is a line he used all the time. I'd never hire anybody if I thought I was smarter. Uh, hi avoid hiring chemical engineers if possible. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, hire only junior faculty who haven't learned bad habits. The, the one who broke that was Ed Cussler. Uh, when, when Cussler and Evans came, they were the first, uh, the first hires at anything other than the the, uh, the introductory level, but we, did, we guessed pretty well. He guessed pretty well on that, so I don't think we suffered. What came of that? Well, it, he, there was a hiring spurt that started in 1957 and went to 1965, in which he hired 10 people out of 14, out of 12 in the department. I'm, I'm sorry, there are 14 on this list. There are two people on this list. That Amundsen, this is the 1966-1967 academic year. There are 14 people uh, on the faculty of the department, 12 of whom Amundsen has either hired, including himself, if you want. Uh, if, you want. Uh, if, you, if you look at that group, this, I, I went through to see what's happened to those people over time. Well, six are members of the National Academy of Engineering, five are regents professors, Four department heads, uh, two were deans, one was a VP and a president. That's, that's, that's the story. None of them, none of them ever left the University of Minnesota until they retired. So what the, the outcome of this, and only two of them were Minnesotans, of course, Fredrickson and Amundsen, you can tell by the names, uh, were the only two that you would expect to be Minnesotans. Uh, but the others came from elsewhere, took their first job in Minnesota, and never left, despite the rewards that all of them were earning and, as you might imagine, the inquiries that came along with that. So th that's what, what one can argue was the, was the cultural beginning of chemical engineering as, as we know it here, the kinds of uh, things one would have expected. What, what happened while people were here? That, that kept them here, if you want. There was a culture developed at the, in chemical engineering uh, once Neil took over, which had, had many aspects to it. One, one of the most important one was the team teaching that we continue to do today. Its origin actually came not so much with Neil as with one of our other colleagues, Bill Rands, who came up with a system of team teaching, which is truly team teaching. Uh, where, uh, where several faculty are part of the teaching operation, where they sit in the class if they're not lecturing, uh, where they uh, have a chance to criticize and, and compliment without it being intimidating to the person who's lecturing, uh, it expected because we all do it that way. Uh, we, it also did a bunch of things for you. It made it possible to take all those non-chemical engineers and make chemical engineers out of them by having them join the teaching team in a particular course for a couple of years before they actually try to teach it on their own. So that would be true then of junior faculty who, didn't, who hadn't had the experience of teaching and more senior people who hadn't had the experience of being in a chemical engineering curriculum. It also meant that since you were cycling through that system that you had a, a flexible teaching core. Uh, that meant you can, you, people could substitute for each other, could move into the lecturing position after someone had finished a cycle. It allowed students to, to, to see different uh, styles of teaching, so you could pick a recitation section that met your needs in a better way. Uh, and teaching and research, uh, it, we stressed high teaching standards, and what we discovered, almost all of us who worked in that system, was that teaching and research has a two-way linkage that it isn't only what we usually say to the public, which is if you're at the forefront of your research, you can be more interesting and exciting as a teacher. Uh, what it captured is the idea that if you teach well and pay attention to it, it's reflected into your conceptual picture of your own research. It gives you, it gives you ways of thinking about your own research, which are ultimately uh, uh, beneficial. You don't always talk to, to people who are at the same stage of development and have adopted your paradigm, have adopted your jargon, have adapted your way of thinking about issues. So uh, we encourage joint research to promote that richness of by association. 
Uh, there was an absence of hierarchy. Uh, I, I was going to, for this lecture to take a picture of the lunch table at the campus club, which for 50 years has been the, the venue for, uh, for faculty meetings on a daily basis, where we are there, uh, some of us now, of course, with 14, we could almost get them all around a table every day. Now this enormous uh, empire that you've built, uh, Dan, <laughs> we hardly know their names <laughs> yeah, along the way. But the absence of hierarchy, the, de the department is a community, and focusing on uh, nurturing and helping young faculty to move to the next stage. One of the things that characterized chemical engineering at this university compared with, uh, I'd say this from a different perspective of looking out, uh, compared with most of the other departments of the school, is that it has perpetuated quality through several generations. It hasn't been a peak and then a drop, because we never stop worrying about the next generation. So we never stop worrying about making sure that over time you continue to build uh, and you continue to maintain this, the strength of the department. There are other aspects of culture. Uh, we did break disciplinary boundaries and move totally away from the technical field. Uh, those of you who will still be around here next fall will uh, be privileged to be uh, exposed to the ARIS lecture series in which we choose a theme which is totally away from a technical theme. And we bring in uh, s s 10 speakers, or I don't know how many Mahesh has in mind for doing this. But the idea is to, to tie into Mackinder's notion that all knowledge is one. It's division into subjects as a concession to human weakness. There's something to be learned about being connected and, and, seeing, and seeing that. Uh, many of us in, in, the, in the Amundsen days used to go around the campus as a group almost, uh, auditing courses in the humanities, auditing courses in, uh, in philosophy uh, together. Uh, Ted Davis, most of you, except for the faculty, won't know Ted. Ted, you could tell, was from Hendersonville, North Carolina. But he spoke French beautifully. And one of the things he organized was a monthly French luncheon where we would go and the requirement was you had to speak French if you were going to come there. We invited a, a, actually a, a young faculty member from the French department, French and Italian department. It was something that we took a, a, as ordinary. Uh, and we were involved in the community. There were, we valued it. Uh, a whole bunch of us, and remember this was the 60s, and we, we were thinking a lot about social issues at that time. There's a group called the Twin Cities Opportunities Industrialization Center, which took high school dropouts and people in, in, a, in a bad state and helped them to get high school degrees. So you had Amundsen and Davis and Keller and Scriven teaching arithmetic, uh, to, which is very hard. Uh, it's much easier to teach college level students who already know your, uh, already have a background. Try teaching them at the beginning, it gets very, very difficult. So we were engaged. Uh, we, uh, if you went to an experimental theater called the Firehouse Theater in the program, it would say, s under sponsors, Department of Chemical Engineering, University of Minnesota. Uh, there, there were many, many things which created the sense of community that we, uh, that we uh, were part of. And some of you may uh, n know the lighter side of the things which, which bound us together. Cussler's famous non-experiment on whether you swim faster in viscous fluid or inviscid fluid, <laughs> which caused a great deal of environmental damage. <laughs> uh, but for which he got the famous Ig Nobel Prize. Uh, it, was, it was something we looked forward to. All of you know the story of Eris and who's who, so I won't burden you with that at this point. And the Eris, now what you probably have heard uh, is that Eris had a poem for every occasion. There were always takeoffs on other uh, serious poetry. Uh, but it, he was so famous, not simply within this university, but nationally, that Caltech called upon him in a regular, th in a regular way to produce uh, a poem to introduce their lacy lecturers. Uh, there was endowed, uh, I think I gave a Mason lecture at, at Stanford once, and he prepared the poetry introduction to it. Uh, this, we have a collection of about 100 or 150 pages of Eris's poetry uh, that, uh, uh, that we keep. I think we should actually do more with it than just keep it. So all of these things 
were stimulated by Amundsen and the people he brought in to develop a community, the terms I use are quality, commitment, and community that, that described this place and the culture, which didn't stay constant but changed. So now if we go back to uh, that uh, uh, Whitaker dull statement about what chemical engineers are, compare it with Skip Scriven. Uh, the practice of chemical engineering like seasonal foliage, he, it's a terrible mixed metaphor, changes. <laughs> like individuals, the sub-disciplines grow, mature, and give birth to others. The discipline like a species evolves, but the essence like a tree is invariant. It's, uh, it's poetic. Uh, it, it is mixed uh, as a metaphor, but, it, but it's nevertheless worth it. Or Eris's approach to what he does. It's easy to accept mathematical modeling as a poetic activity, for in modeling we're engaged in a form of imitating nature in mathematical terms. This was what gave rise in many ways to our contribution at Minnesota to a paradigm shift, to a movement from the, a, a field defined by the industries that, that it serves, uh, that organize around, un, uh, around phenomena rather than explanations, to mathematical modeling and the creative leap, the birth of chemical engineering science. And so the terms we now are more familiar with is defining what it is we do. Reactor analysis, transport phenomena, dimensional analysis, process control, chemical thermodynamics. You can pick what you think belongs in there. But that is where we brought the field. And we didn't do it alone. Let's acknowledge that there was some help in the particular, uh, in particular, of course, the, the Transport Phenomena book came out that, uh, that Bird, Stewart, and Lightfoot did. We always were very close together. And I would affirm, uh, assert that the change in paradigm in chemical engineering was really due to these two schools, Minnesota and Wisconsin. That others followed, everybody followed, but that was really where we introduced the, the change in paradigm and we introduced a lot of ideas concerning uh, how you do, uh, how you run a department. In fact, I once introduced Neil Amundsen saying I would never forgive him for thinking that you could run the university the way he ran the department. Uh, it, it, it didn't work that way. <laughs> but I treasure the department along the way. <laughs> That's another joke. Okay. So we come to the last segment, if you want, of this development over the 100 years, the marriage of chemical engineering and metallurgy. Uh, the story of that uh, is uh, actually, it, it, it's, uh, I should bring up the first statement, uh, the virtues of an arranged marriage. This was not something that we had thought out. What happened is in 1970, the dean came to uh, uh, Amundsen and said, uh, uh, we've got a problem with enrollments and, uh, and funding over in the School of Mines and Metallurgy. And so we've decided to break up the School of Mines and Metallurgy and mines will go to civil engineering and you've got metallurgy. And we said, when do we vote? You know, <laughs> no vote, no vote. Uh, you've got it is what, is, is, is what we heard. And uh, we had never thought about it, and metallurgy was not something we knew about. We were going to bring in Bill Gerber, who would tell us about it, and we were going to bring in, uh, but we were also going to bring in Chris McCosco to expand that notion, to say, well, if we've got it, what do we do with it? Because we only do good things in this department, we don't do bad things. And that's where Skip Scriven came in. And we said, we got to figure out what would happen if you bisociated these fields. What could you do if you did that? And we began to think about that. We began to know the other side. We began to hire and do what we've done in the spurt of hiring in chemical engineering to say, we've got to build it up. And it's going to be part of the whole. And the whole is going to be, uh, there's going to be a synergistic effect. We're going to get more than we had. So we're going to get to know you, build bridges, find common interests. We're going to move from metallurgy, not eliminate it, but expand it to a much broader notion of material science. And the first thing in bringing in somebody like Chris was Chris was, did processes. We understood processes. That was, uh, that was chemical engineering stuff. So it looked familiar. And even if it smelled funny, uh, <laughs> we thought it would be okay. 
and it was okay. And we shared the cultural values. We shared the cultural values of bringing people in, of engaging them in, in what it is we did. We overcame what was a false dichotomy. What I, I, a theory and experiment. When I first came here, people around the country would say, we in Minnesota, they're all theoreticians. They don't do experiments. And we'd say, well, wait a minute. Experiments have a theoretical basis just as a, a, a mathematical model does. There is no distinction. What there is is a distinction between empiricism and pragmatism in theory. That, uh, but uh, but it's certainly in these new fields, there's a much greater attention to the idea that exp an experimental uh, activity has a theoretical basis. It may not be, it isn't only the mathematical part of it. We, uh, so we over, uh, I think that, that we were helped to overcome that. We brought chemistry back to chemical engineering. I'm not talking about the department, but for a long time, the, the focus on, on, on actual chemistry uh, was lost. And, and what I see now is it's back much more, and we're much more balanced in, in, the, in that, in how we, we run the department. Uh, and we have moved from association when we first came together to by association, where there are lots of connections that people have developed that are evident almost every day. And so it's been a good thing. Uh, now, uh, the question is, are there challenges to the innovation? Are there things that we need, still need to think about? This is not history anymore. This is me wondering where the field is going, because if we had a discipline that started out being defined by its industry, that moved into understanding its more fundamental aspects, that began to add things like material science, that began to see that with its fundamental aspects, we could begin to join it and move from association and applying our knowledge to, to by association. And we did that in some, in some ways with biology, uh, but in some ways we have separate departments. So the question is, what does the future hold? Is there a further change that's going to take place in the evolution of what chemical engineering and material science is? Is there a point where some divides off and some comes back together? I don't know the answer to that, but what's interesting to think about are ways in which uh, uh, we are going to see further changes. I put in this product design, it isn't explicitly for Ed Custler, but I was thinking about it. Product design in the early days of Doc Mann was, was uh, an application, uh, an empirical application, not of fundamental notions, but of what experience had shown. Uh, what we do in product design, as I remember in, in, in working with him on a couple of uh, semesters, starts with fundamental ideas, starts with by association, starts with, con with, with, with something uh, at a more scientific level, and uses it intelligently to build something. Uh, that is a different direction of, of creation of, uh, of uh, a product than, uh, than otherwise. Enough said, uh, the, I've now worked very much more in public policy and see ways in which I think it's very important to think about how the worlds of science and the worlds of public policy come together in the Mackinder sense, because one can't exist very well without the other. They either interfere with each other or help each other. So that's pretty much the end of the story. I haven't turned, talked much about the product. Uh, we, we have our share of, 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 of graduates who have uh, moved into, into industry and have done very, very well. Many of them have come back and, and, and help us along. And Piercy and Gore, whose names you see through this building, uh, are certainly two of those. Uh, but the thing that I think is unique about this department that's an important part of it, but we've had an extraordinary influence on, on education in the country. This is a one place, for example, where we, three of our graduates have been presidents or are presidents of universities. That's really a rather an unusual finding. If I, I couldn't count the deans and the department heads and the people, it's hard, you can hardly go to a school anywhere in the country that doesn't have an influence of Minnesota on its faculty. Uh, and in its administration. And we have, I think that's, it wasn't the intentional single uh, output of what we do, but it's something that has either come about because the people who are attracted to come here as students are people who have those broader interests, or there's something in the way we try to expose people to ideas that, 
that certainly include the technical fields, but go further than that? Well, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, the last slide I'm going to put up is one that uh, Bates used to use to prod himself in the morning, and that was uh, <laughs> that, that was uh, uh, I've got this thing from Amundsen, and what am I going to do with it for a long time? I, I don't worry about this. Uh, <laughs> you're doing well, and I'm going to stop there. Thank you all very much.